Welcome to the Morse Code Podcast, where we talk with entrepreneurially minded creatives in music, film, and writing. This is Corby, and I'm hoping these conversations inspire you to push deeper into your own work, whether you're a full-time professional or just curious about what it's actually like to live as an indie creative. Okay, so I'm really excited to bring you this conversation with composer, producer, songwriter, and musician, Tim Lauer. I don't have enough time to really do justice to Tim's creative pedigree, but well, I'll try. In his capacity as an A-list keyboard player here in Nashville, Tim has played on literally hundreds of records with artists like Taylor Swift, The Civil Wars, Lionel Richie, Keith Urban, Foy Vance, Insane Clown Posse, and more. He's also produced artists like Mickey Echo, Rhiannon Giddens and John Oates, but lately his interests have led him to the world of television and film. He followed T-Bone Burnett and Buddy Miller as executive music producer for the TV show Nashville, seasons five and six. He's produced over 200 cast recordings for shows including Nashville, Tell Me a Story, Greenleaf, Carnival Row, Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, and Big Sky. A few weeks ago, he was arranging strings for a new Smashing Pumpkins album, and last night, he was at the Skirmerhorn with Vince Gill, Malcolm Gladwell, and a 50-voice choir. (laughs) It's always something different with this guy. In this two-hour conversation, we really get into it, how Tim has dealt with ego and applying his own talents to achieve someone else's vision, the Pareto distribution of Nashville studio musicians, where a very small number of cats play on almost all the big records, We also discuss Tim's purpose-driven approach to music creation, how he's always thinking of where a song might fit in or make money. I've worked with Tim for years. We've made an album together, my self-titled record, and we've also produced tracks for sync licensing. So we talk about how the approaches are so different, sync versus song. Finally, we discuss the importance of maintaining a spiritual practice and a supportive community in terms of staying sane and unjaded. If you get something out of the Morse Code podcast, please like and subscribe and give us five stars and send me a new capo because I lost mine. And now here's my conversation with Tim Lauer. Uh, Dude, thank you so much for making time for me. Well, we know each other very well. I'm just trying to make it feel like we're... I still am grateful, man. I'm just talking to you. It's fun to hang out. <laughs> and uh, I thought we'd get into this uh, with, with an anecdote that I was part of. This is maybe like, I want to say 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And you had been, um, so it wasn't a tribute exactly, but it's something that Belmont did where they brought one of their alum in to come in and the, the curtain call award, the curtain call. They come in <clears throat> and you are, your job is there to inspire and enlighten the the hopefuls of the next generation and you get up there among other things um you you did a great job and a lot of people were came away inspired i think Uh but you opened it with um hey everybody okay everybody out there raise your hand if you have a plan b Mm -hmm. and probably half the half no i would say all but four (laughs) okay this is the story even better yeah yeah yeah. you know of the music majors um yeah. Okay. So yeah, of the music majors, I mean, how many have a plan B yeah. and all but four yeah. raise their hand. Most of the room raises their hand. Okay. What did you say? I'm curious how you remember. Well, it. what I remember is that you probably should just quit now. No, <laughs> I said, I no. I said, how many of you people have a plan B and most people raise their hand. How many people here as music majors have nothing that you can imagine falling back on. Not only could you, but you can't imagine. Like you, this is this is it, this is it. <clears throat> and four people kind of half raised their hand. And I said, "Well, I'm betting on you four, and maybe two of you will be able to support yourself in a career in in music making. And so, for the rest of you, if you have a plan B, and then I talk right into the mic." Take it now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, probably, as is the case with most sage wisdom, not what one wants to hear, but probably what a lot of those kids needed to hear and what is the reality, like it or not. I don't think I would do it quite the same now, but maybe shock shock value has value. I mean, it got a laugh, a nervous laugh, but... Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the nervous la- the laugh was from... All my friends 
that showed up to support me that <laughs> were laughing at what I just said to those kids. I was one of them. Well, um, so you were that kid once, and was that the situation that you had when you were at Belmont, where you were just like, I've got, I don't even know. Well, I mean, the, part of the thing is, you know, I remember in high school, I remember it on a, in a track practice, several of my high school friends saying, you know, you have to have something to fall back on. And I was just kind of like, well, if I can't do this, I'll, I'll, I'll teach piano lessons. If I can't teach piano lessons, I'll play drums in a polka band. If I can't play drums in a polka band, I'll play piano in a, in a hotel lobby bar. Like I just had all like, like I'll do anything. Yeah. You know? Like I'll be okay because, yeah. And really that's kind of what, it, when I pull back and think, well, good thing because I kind of have had to do a lot of things to float the boat. Yeah. From where and I, I enjoy. And, and what I've learned is I enjoy that. Um, and one thing that sets you apart from the other starry eyed dreamers is that you weren't trying to be an, an artist. Like you, you didn't need to make the records. It would need to be your, your, you didn't need to be a star. You just wanted to play music for a living. I was hardly, I was barely in a couple of bands, you know, like I was kind of talked in like being in a band that they're going to go try to get a record deal. And I was kind of thinking, ah, I don't know. We'll see. But I never wanted <laughs> Never wanted that. Um, never had any, never appealed to me to have my name in the cover of a record or to have like a promo shot or. Yeah. It, that never even entered my mind. And, and to this day, you know, I would say that one of the things, we've worked together a lot on over yeah. 10, 15 years almost now in um, all kinds of different projects. And one of the joys of working with you um, is how you are kind of like a, how you want it is how you like it. The best I can do, you know, that's your attitude. It's like, say, you, say it again. well, how, how you want it as an artist yeah. is, oh, oh, I'm saying to the artist, you are. Yeah. How can I help you? How can I help you realize this, your vision? And I'm going to help yeah, you realize how can this get closest to what you imagined in your head or better. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, um, so there's a certain like lack of ego with that. Would yeah. you say? Yeah. Um, where would you say, and we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but it's always fun to spin off a little mm -hmm. philosophical, philosophically. Um, where would you say, like, you do encounter ego? Well, in myself? Yeah, but in, first, in, in the there's a side. There's a twist. <clears throat> there's, there's, a, <laughs> there, there's an ego side of being that way, which says, I'm so friggin' confident in myself. Mm. You can't stump me. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want it like that? Fine. Oh, you want to be like, this is an eight, eighth grade girl who wrote this in the choir room and you need to play like that. Sure. Give me Bruce Hornsby. You got it. Give mm -hmm. me, you know what I mean? Yeah. And just kind of like, I, I don't care. I'll, I'll just, I've heard a lot of music and made a lot of music. Just tell me what you want. And it's, it's not that I don't care and it's not, but there's no ego that it has to be my preference, mm -hmm. but there is some, I don't know if it's ego or confidence. It's confidence. Yeah. For at least <laughs> It confidence. just says, it's like, Hey, I'm going to make more music after you leave and, and just try to stump me. I want you to be happy. Yeah. You know? Um, so the journey, we're going to get into where, like where you are now and what you're excited about for the future. But mm -hmm. I, I want to start with like Kyle on who's mm -hmm. engineering the show. He was excited mm -hmm. for this day because no, you nice. know, he, uh, he's a really great musician himself. Mm -hmm. And as a lot of us who moved to Nashville, um, we always, you know, heard about the Nashville cats and he's like, the dream gig was to be an A-list studio musician. And, you know, I think that among other labels, <clears throat> you're an A-list studio musician. You played on I, the credits. There's so many credits. And, uh, what were you, you can just tell me the, the little anecdote you told me on the phone today on the way over here. Oh, uh, well, <clears throat> I had, you know, a friend, friend of mine, a massive session playing legend, who's a good friend sent me, so he had, Googled, he had put in a bunch of people's names that we all know. And, and then how many credits are on, on people's uh, names, like studio musicians, yeah, like a little pissing that are contest on, of, that are yeah. on all music or something like that. And he had a whole list and I was absolutely shocked at how many credits I had, which was like 1,575. Yeah. 1,575 <laughs> so, credits. Like and, it, and like there were people that I had, this is not bragging. It's just a fact. Sure. I didn't know this until like three hours ago. You know, it's like people that I think, man, 
that guy is amazing. I, I'm privileged to know him or have known him. I'll never have that sort of career. I'll never play on this many records. I'll never have that kind of impact. It was just a privilege to have been in the room with that guy. And I will have like more credits. <laughs> and I was just like, I always felt like the imposter. Like I wasn't an A-lister. Like I was the D-lister. Yeah. <laughs> and I, that might be a testament more to your your personality, um, perhaps. Because you, you've said this before, too, is you're always you know, this is not unique. Like the grass is always greener. I'm not always, qu I'm never quite there yet. Once in a while you encounter somebody with a ton of hubris or swagger, but, uh, <laughs> those people aren't too fun to be around in the long run. I don't know. And I don't, I don't know if their careers pan out in the long run either, but, um, well, that's amazing, dude. So like well, it or not, and, you're, and, you're in there. And until, you know, the last, within the last year, <clears throat> I mean, I think I've, sort of the story that I've told myself and maybe other people like a therapist or somebody is like the, 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 the story is how I'm such a failure. You know, I went mm -hmm. to that show in and of itself in New York with, Oh man, that show incredible. is incredible. You watch it on Netflix. Everybody should watch it. It's about identity. Let me, let me throw this out. There's some people you should breeze through There's a show on, I think it's still on Netflix. It's called in Oops. and of itself. Yes. And we, I can't remember the, he's, it's Derek, a music. To Guardio or something like that. Yeah, in and of itself is what uh, to remember. And um, it's extraordinary, even the, the Netflix. And it's basically a videotaped, video uh, filmed version of a off-Broadway production, no, a I single went, man, one-man it, show. And you Theater, went to, 100 yeah. seats, no microphone. Describe it a little bit, and then you well, can you bring it. you walk in, in, and there's a wall, maybe twice as long as this, and maybe up, you know, up to five and a half, six, five, six feet tall. From the bottom, from your knees to your forehead, there are cards, smaller than a three by five card. It says, I am a dot, dot, dot. Hanging on hooks, right? Hanging or on hooks. Like yeah. Banjo player. I am a mother. I am a dog lover. I am a teacher. I'm a lover. I'm a friend. I'm a dad. I'm a convicted felon. I'm a whatever. All these things. And I was, what am I? What? I was looking, looking, looking. And I got so happy because I found the one. It was like there was a spotlight on it. And everyone in the audience had, you picked one As upon before, entering before the theater. Before you're in, this, in yeah. your seat, you picked your thing. Yeah. And it was like angels sang in a spotlight. And I picked the card and said, I am a failure. <laughs> I was so happy that I found it. And then I, some voice in my head said, That's, let's not do that. Uh -huh. let's, let's not go there. Intellectually, you know that that's not true. And it's just not helpful. And I was like, okay. And so I put it back and I looked for a good while longer and I picked the next one I picked, which I stuck with, which I am a tightrope walker. Tightrope walker. That one, I thought I can, I can. You that, know that. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it also, but it set in motion, like now I have to, you know, I didn't even see the show. Mm. Now I got some work to do. Like that's mm. what I picked mm. is my definition. Mm. Not even friend, father. I mean, come on. Yeah. That's that means I got some work to do. And and the punchline of as far as the show goes yeah. is that the guy does this kind of an amazing magic illusion show. Magic it's, 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 and it's like a coming of age yeah, story. It's I did it. Who are we? It's, it's just so you? unique. Yeah. But the grand finale is he goes walks out into the crowd and goes down the line to every single person in the room. He points at them. Goes, you've turned your card in at this point. So, you know, it's a, how, how does he know? And he'll look at you and say, you are a podcaster. You are a, you know. Yeah, podcaster, and mother, just, and every single person. Just, you can't believe it. People are crying oh, in the yeah. audience. You're, There's other things incredible. that make people cry. It's, yeah. Yeah. Crazy. So you picked failure. failure. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Like has more credit than Tom Bukai. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's mm. like I had to sort of be able to like, well, could I like, go of that story uh -huh. you know so like and then it, it's like so what so if i'm not that so what am i what am i now yeah like that's what's, so interesting that these two things coexist because you started off five minutes ago talking about how you know is it ego or is it just like extraordinary conf it's like a ton of confidence so you're really confident <laughs> in one sense like you can't you cannot stump me i'm here i'm gonna see this through you're gonna be pleased i promise yes. And then they leave police and you're like, I'm a failure. <laughs> what? That's so crazy, man. People are so yeah. Yeah, I know. complicated. I know. And so then the answer is if I'm, if I'm not that, what am I? And, and that it sounds so dumb and poetic, but I'm a human. I'm just mm -hmm. a person. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that's what I am. Um, let's, uh, I kind of want to get into the, the mechanics of the studio musician experience a little bit insofar as I know it. And I'd like to know more and I'll tell, maybe start by saying like my impression or from talking to you and Lucido and a couple other cats is that there's 25 guys give or take in town that are playing on all of the, the big country records or, or the first call guys that they, and you get, once you kind of get up there, it takes years and years, you sort of work your way up. The, you, part of how that works is whoever's producing the new Eric church record, you know, they got their, their guys, their first calls. And so they call and if you're available, then you, you do it. And if you're not, then they go to the next call. But that guy who comes in now or they wait or they, or they wait. Yeah. Depending whatever, but you kind of want to always be available for the big record. And, um, so what, how does that look like for the, in the pros and cons of a lifestyle? Because I would say in the pro side, you, you know, a lot of guys, especially as they get families, uh, kids, and they they have, you know, a community. They don't want to travel very much. They want to stay home. So I would say that's awesome. I mean, you're, you're on a family, well, and, and you're on family vacation and somebody says, Hey man, can you come this afternoon and do an overdub for the Shania Twain record? Yeah. And you go, um, yeah, let me, hold on. Let me check on one thing. And then you're like in Murfreesboro or something. And it's like, what should we do? And, I, and I would say that's the the con side of yeah, this is your that you're always like, on call. I guess we should go back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. And yeah, you, you're you're not you don't want to travel very much. You're yeah. always kind of thinking about it because what am I going to miss? Yeah. And um, so that that's an interesting thing that I think a lot of you know guys don't imagine because it's awesome not to have to sit on a tour bus day in and day out. That's a young man's gig. Um, but on the other hand, you're always beholden to the phone and the call and you don't want to be close cause you got to say yes. Cause if you don't say yes, then, um, so what, what did you like? Like, that's what I know about it. But what did you like about those years when you were like all in and how, oh. how old were you when you were like kind of cracked the code and were in that soup and then versus when you sort of like started doing other things and it was, it was pretty, pretty young. I was pretty. Pretty young, mm -hmm. in my early early twenty, early to mid twenties, when I started doing sessions, and I had a few road gigs, but they were I was already an active in, in playing sessions. I had all the cartridge and all the all the cases and the instruments and the, the thing, and but they were big enough tours that eh, and and there, there were bands with like legendary players also. And I thought this is this is going to be okay and was maybe 150 dates 100 dates instead of like 250 dates or something like mm. that um what i did the question was what did i enjoy about it uh yeah yeah like I what mean, did you when you were like at the height of it i don't know height of it when, when you were just like doing it a well, lot I mean, let's be uh unless like that is not my i'm not in i'm not one of those guys anymore like kind of by a couple of reasons but we could talk about that studio later. cat guys right yeah I yeah no, sessions, that's a, but i'm not i'm not doing the 10 2 and 6 thing but there was a time ten, where, and say what 10 2 well, and 6 sessions, is union sessions are 10 to 1 2 to 5 6 to 9 mm -hmm. and when i was doing it a lot i mean i had i had cartage which means somebody picks up your takes your gear sets it up for you and i did there were many days i have three cartridges you know somebody at 10 o'clock <laughs> I'll go in, you're all set up. See ya. I walk out the door, grab some lunch, go to minute section two o'clock. I'm all set up Is there. there like, I mean, the little kid in me would, goes like, okay, the first why, first couple times it's happening, you, you got to feel like a rock star. You're not carrying totally. your own gear. You just it's show the up. Best, the piano's yeah. in tune here. Yeah. It's already it's like the best. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Um, and then at some point, though, you, do you start to take it for granted or do you start, it starts to become a job like everything else or? Um... Well, I mean, it is a service industry, mm -hmm. right? And it is, there's, a, there's, part of it is creative and part of it is recreative. Mm. Okay. So, um, and I don't, first of all, I think music is magical and it's incredible and, and beautiful and hard to define and, and elusive and, and dealing in just minutia and, uh, and years of practice. And it can also feel like you're building a deck. Hey, my neighbor over there has a deck. I want one like that. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, but I don't want the stairs there. I want them over here. 
All give right, me, the, give me that bit different. Yeah. So it's basically like, you know that song that's on the radio? You know that kind of piano part? We want something like that. Mm-hmm. Let me hear it for a second. Okay. Build, here I go building the deck. So it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's recreative. I'm listening to something that they're chasing, and I'm giving them what they want. And, and there's a lot of references. You know, we want this real Tom Petty. Okay, so I'm re- referencing, I'm recreating something that Ben Mont already created. Ben Montage. But of course, he's show. already, he's also influenced by his influences, yeah. which were influenced by their influences. Yeah. Um, but the, the point being is that you're not walking in, it's not the Tim show. It's, it's you're walking in, you're like, okay, what? Okay, that's what you need. This is what you're, I'm going to do my best to give you that. And many, many, many of the sessions that I was called for and am still called for are guitar heavy. Um, you know, so many things that I've played on, uh, it was almost like trim work. I don't, again, I don't mean, I'm, it's an analogy, not a insult or denigration sure. of the work, where it's just like, man, uh, or lighting director. Like, this room is cool. Something's just off. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you need a soft bulb coming from that direction, and it'll just... So that might be like a little organ part or a little synth bed or just a little some piano chords down low to fill. Or it's, or it's structural, like, like a house. Like, I'm listening, and I'm going, man, we're missing, uh, we're missing frequencies between the bass and the electric guitar and the vocal, and there's this hole <clears throat> between the bass and the vocal that is making this track feel weird or lopsided or not not whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna be the guy that goes I'm gonna put up a, a pillar you know post here or joist whatever that means here you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So um, and I enjoy, I still enjoy that. That's very producery. You yeah. know, I play a lot of parts that you don't have to hear live. Because they help hold the structure of the record together. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah, sure. When I never was still, I'm not very show off y. You know, I don't play fast or difficult. It has a lot of value. Yeah. But it's not in like, man, can you believe that? <laughs> yeah, I, th- this, um, I wonder maybe in the guitar territory, same deal, except there's a little, because you said, like you said, it's often guitar heavy music. There's a little bit more of a demand for taking center stage and like throwing down. Um, But in country music setting and maybe a lot of pop settings, mostly it's a uh, supportive role. Um, And well, there's another thing that you have in your kit uh, is a lot of, you know, composition knowledge. I, you know, you're really a, a, a forest guy as much as you are a trees guy too. Mm-hmm. And, um, these days you do a lot of string arranging. Mm-hmm. You just did like the new Joss Stone record mm-hmm. and, um, I've seen on, on the gram, um, during those recordings. Um, how, cause she was making me post. She was like, nice. She's like, oh, I'm going to sit here until you post, but you know, it's like, you, you, you need <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm glad she did. Cause it was cool. Is it at like ocean way? And yeah, she's right. like, she's like, if I'm looking for, if I'm looking for, if I was recommending players for her live band and stuff, she goes, the first thing I'm going to do is go to their Instagram. I want to see them working. Yeah. You don't have anything. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked because you've been a little bit better about it. Yeah. A little bit, yeah, a little, a little bit. bit better. Um, okay. So you were a session guy and then, you know, uh, at some point, opportunities knocks or maybe you started when we started hanging out was you i want to say early on in your like sync licensing yeah. efforts so i will i'll say this um about the 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 session playing um i really i i re i have enjoyed it and and uh, i'm I, you know i'll take sessions now and yeah, now, there, there's a singular joy in looking out around a room at an amazing group of world class musicians playing together with the headphones on and just going. I even if it's not a great song or a great artist, and you just go, I can't, be, I can't believe, yeah, how this feels, how this is coming together, and I yeah. and I get to play with drummers that are on the cover of Modern Drummer magazine that I read when I was a kid as a drummer. I grew mm-hmm. up as a drummer, and people who are invited to podcasts to talk about their work. You know, these are my friends and we're playing music together and it's amazing. Yeah. And also the sort of like the higher, (laughs) I gotta be so, I I don't want to say this. 
the, the more you sort of ascend into this wherever you the know, stratosphere of- um the more s- the music s- seems to be run by fear mm. and the more same it becomes more same samey yeah. samey this yeah. is about we need we're spending a lot of money so it needs to be really close to something that was already successful mm-hmm. so we can't take too many chances or those mm-hmm. kinds of those kinds of things um and um you know me i i really i'm really j- joyful and i love like like the the idea that floats by you and you go do that you know mm-hmm. and like miking things wrong and like mm-hmm. what's the worst mic we have here and who's the person who plays the bass the worst they should play this part i mean yeah. i yeah. love that stuff. Yeah, yeah yeah and it's the total opposite of you know label record making and so i've always had sort of this side things other things that I, which is into the sync and licensing and producing of indie artists and stuff like that, where I thought for my sanity, um, I need I need an outlet to try these things. You know, like part of the deal with doing less sessions was I got really tired of like trying to put something out there mm-hmm. that would just get shot down mm-hmm. or usually because of i don't know it's just a two something it's always two this two that two that mm-hmm. two vintage i notice two it too much too, yeah, yeah it's yeah. too it's too divisive you know it's not predictable and you know it's, a device a divisive lick yeah no it's yeah, dangerous and you love it or hate it you know we don't want any we don't want a 10 or a zero we just yeah. want a bunch of fives <laughs> Uh, no, That's I mean modern, yeah, literally, That's, yeah, sure. And so again, it we sounds, it sounds so cynical and so complaining, but I just, I just thought, I'm willing to go over to my place <laughs> and lose money today mm-hmm. to try some stuff that I know is pretty cool, mm-hmm. but nobody's gonna let me do. Maybe it isn't cool. Maybe mm-hmm. I'm just wrong. Maybe, maybe I just need to do it because I need to do it. Mm-hmm. I just, I need to have something that I have a little more control over the final yeah product a little art for art's sake just right? a little bit of yeah um or a little uh, you know i'll even say you know i think art for art's sake is when i get a commission from the alias ensemble to write a piece for four stringed instruments and four electronic instruments now i can't pitch that to selling sunset I mean, that's truly art for art's sake. And they mm-hmm. give me a thank you note and bottle wine, and that's it. That's <laughs> art for art's sake. I mean, like, a create unbound creativity, where, mm-hmm. where maybe I, I still would like to maybe recoup my efforts, but by God, I'm going to, there's going to be a, there's going to be a little hair on this. Mm-hmm. You, know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, there's, this is going to have a little more personality. And, uh, and, but when you're making that, you're not, this isn't like a, I got to make this track that's going to live in my basement. I don't care if it does, or maybe, maybe you do, but I think, I what, I think would what never do that. Yeah. That's what I was going to say is that one thing I think about you is that been a consistent through line is that there's always an angle. There's always this thought of like, where can this fit in? I want to say the marketplace or like, how could I, possibly and i think we started working together because and like i i'm not fooling myself i don't think but you know like if you remember uh i had given you my little life this little track yeah. and i'm like this is a sync song man yeah. and i was like i don't have any money i was valet, valet parking cars at the time i was like <clears throat> But I think we'd have a good time. Yeah. And I've got this cash that I could, you know, cover some of your expenses for this day. And I think that we get one day and we could make this thing and see what happens. Yes. And that turned into a record. Yeah. But the whole point of that record uh, was like, let's make these kind of Corby songs like very sync friendly. Yeah. And so there was that, that was my, you know, version of that, that ethos. Um, and it's to this day, I think that's kind of you're, you don't, you don't just sit and go like, ah, let's just hang out and make some songs. Never. Yeah. I don't think that's wrong. Yeah. And I, I'm kind of jealous of people who are able to do that. Cause I think it's kind of beautiful, mm. but I've never done that. I'm just going to mm. jam. I'm just doing this. For, I'm taking it. Mm-mm. I've never in practicing. I've always been aware of how I could apply it. Maybe I'll pick my practice based on, you know, if, if people keep, you know, there was a time Nikki Hopkins kept coming up. People, I just, they, it just, everywhere kept coming up. So I called Pat Buchanan, who's 
a, a big Stones fan and they say, hey, make me a Nicky Hopkins playlist. And I just drove around and for about a month or so, that's all I listened to. I never sat down and learned one lick. It was mm-hmm. all osmosis. And um, part of my practice was the listening. Mm-hmm. You know? And I think I, I got a new tool in my toolbox. You mm-hmm. know? And uh, yeah, I think if I'm going to mess around with like, you know, a felt piano, solo piano, like I'm thinking like maybe this would be a good something for the iTunes uh, uh, peaceful sleep playlist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm just totally like I work in the music business <clears throat> um, and or maybe it's like uh, I'm super creative and I love creativity, but I'm not part of the arts community. How I don't. Well, I think the arts, the arts community, I think of as people that like um, need outside support. You know, like mm. we're going to make our art, and then Martha Ingram is going to donate to the symphony. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. people that are making stuff that it can afford to lose money because there's patrons. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, I'm going to just make cool stuff and I'm going to get my kicks and various little categories of kick getting <laughs> mm-hmm. like lyrics or like sounds or production or, or collaboration. But I'm always going to be aware of where it could go so I can keep eating and putting my kids in school and buy some gear. And I was going to ask you, do you think that's an innate part of your personality or your approach to music that you didn't even notice was happening? Or did it come out of like life circumstances? Like when you had your first kid, Well, I got married at 23 and had a kid at 30 or something, you know? So that was part of it. Mm. And I think part of it, it just, it was just like, I think that I'm doing enough of different things that I can on the whole get my creative juices stretched and exercised that that's I mixed up my metaphors but you know I mean it's like I can I can hit these creative buttons yeah all of them eventually through the various genres circles and not lets I'm having yeah and that might be a toothpaste ad or it might be uh, a Rodney Crowell overdub or it might be um, writing a song for the end title of a Netflix movie. You know? Yeah. And maybe like, you know, one of the things that this, this podcast is about is there's an entrepreneurial angle to it because um, we're all figuring out how to do this. And so at the end of the day, it's a, you're a hustler, man. Right. You know, it's a different kind of hustle, but it's you're constantly like seeking opportunity Absolutely. for the next thing. And, you know, the thing is like, it's not like I made so much money as a session player that now I'm just sitting back, you know, staring at my credits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's some jobs pay more than others. And, yeah. and I think you could argue that it pays just fine, it, it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and there's, there's the things, but I, but, um, it, it's something you got to keep doing, you know, mm-hmm. like you don't play in Taylor Swift records and then go, thank you and good night. I'm out here. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, it you pays the same as the artist who got dropped next week. You know? Yeah. And um, that, that's crazy to know. Like people don't, I don't think know that, that no, you, you get, as a session musician, you, you play get, on a, t- a record that sells a 6 million copies. You're getting paid the same. It's, as it's the a union that never comes out. Yeah. Yes. So. And there are some things in place, like some reuse things and mm-hmm. some, some royalty, but in general, yeah. Um, and so uh, it's not like I'm now saying, boy, what a run, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't have to work, you know. I'm just kind of saying, I did that and I'm really, I'm really glad for that. And I still, you know, spend, you know, what, however many three hour blocks a month doing that. Mm-hmm. But it's something that I d- didn't want and don't want to do. Part of it is when I started getting into TV mm-hmm. and then I was so busy, like I didn't have time to, I didn't have time to call my mother, mm-hmm. you know, let alone, um, you know, do a session. So you get called three times. That's, that's the thing. You know, somebody calls you once. Oh man, that's a bummer. Twice. Mm-hmm. Now they've used the other person maybe twice. Mm-hmm. Third time you're off the list. Yeah. And I was, I was just off the list. So yeah. I saw that when I started doing Nashville. Well, really, when I started doing Greenleaf first. Okay, well, I, I, we can go on 
this is so great and interesting and we're covering a lot of territory and we just don't have a ton of time, but I do want to spend a little bit of time on before, like I want to talk about sync licensing and then I want to talk about uh, the Nashville experience of working on the television show. Um, but can we spend a moment on the sync licensing game for people that haven't done it? You've had a lot of success at it. And part of that's a lot of create creative talent and chutzpah. But, um, what, talk about the other, like, what is it, what is it like for you when, when now when you get a sync, you're writing to briefs a lot, mm -hmm. right? And the turnaround time is sometimes Pretty fast. I mean, yeah. I, I also want to just the, 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 the sync and licensing sort of has to be put in the light of, I had a, a major publisher, music row publishing deal for 10 years. Mm hmm. And um, I just, I tried so hard. I wasn't trying to be weird or different. I was trying to give them hit songs. Mm -hmm. And it just was not. Weird. As a songwriter. As writing, a songwriter. Yeah. And my, my publisher at, at BMG said, I'm buying you a plane ticket. I don't want you to change your ammunition, change your target. Hmm. Don't change anything you're doing. You're going to go to London. I went to back to back London for seven days, Stockholm for seven days. Berlin for seven days. And I think out of those three weeks, I got like, <laughs> I think like eight or 10 cuts mm -hmm. and a winner, Eurovision song contest winner, a Coke ad, uh, BMW ad, you know, and it was just like, wait a second, what is happening here? Mm. German idol. And it was like, this is, this is weird. Like I'm just doing the same thing I was doing in Nashville. Mm. And people over there go, thank you for bringing that. That's just what we need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I, what I realized is that maybe, you know, it's finding the new target. And then 9-11 happened. And that was a lot changed uh, as far as like, because um, I was writing lyrics. I was writing all the, all the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And they the companies overseas quit making uh, English content lyric for their territories. Mm. So like they quit signing German artists that sang in English. They would just sell an, an American artist. So my, the thing I was bringing, the uniqueness that I was bringing as a lyricist. Demand evaporated. Just wasn't kind of there. Yeah. I still have a lot of great friendships over there and I still do some work with some of these people. But that kind of went away. And then I, uh, uh, Katie Herzig, for some, I don't know why, we wrote one day and it was so much fun. Katie Herzig uh, is a known quantity in Nashville and really one of the most successful artists, singer songwriters in the sync space. And I'll just say when, like when I first moved here, it was just 20, uh, 2007 ish, eight. Uh, that was the game. Like for anybody who was kind of not trying to play the country deal, it was like you wanted to get a song on Grey's Anatomy. Yeah. You wanted to get a song on a big show. Right. And there were a couple of artists, a handful of artists, Katie, Matthew Perriman Jones, uh, Sandra, a um, couple of other cats that were hitting it over and over again. Right. Trent Dabbs, the 10 out of 10 thing. Um, and so you wrote, this is right around that yeah, time that would so have been, you wrote oh, with Katie. I can write with Katie and I'll get a, I'll get Grey's Anatomy that paid two years of my draw at Sony Tree or BMG, mm -hmm. and my the the my um, my batting average on sync songs I immediately realized it was much higher than my batting average on music business songs. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how that's how I got into that, and was realizing that that. Nobody was asking me to produce country radio records, and I wanted them to. Mm. And nobody was cutting my songs for country radio, and I wanted them to. And but, you were like maybe thirty, yeah. around early thirties. Yeah. And I was okay. just doing, I was just doing what I, I was, I, I was just like, I think this would sound nice, and I would do it, and then people would say, "Let's make that a target ad." And we're like, "Well, that was interesting." You know? <laughs> <laughs> right with Matty Diaz, and then it'd be like, "Oh, well, okay." Yeah. You know, and um, and then I developed Mickey Echo and was part of this. So I was all those 10 out of 10 folks, you know, and I was a little older than them, you know, mm -hmm. but I was kind of like cool Uncle Tim, maybe, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I just I wasn't trying to be anything other than like making music that I liked. Mm -hmm. and, Same MO, different target. And, it, and yeah, and it, and it, it kind of worked, you know.
Uh, and then, but you've, it's persisted over time. You, you still are doing it. You're like, yeah. last time I called you, you were writing a song for a t- an ad. Yeah. So there's two, uh, two ways that, that have, one is a brief mm-hmm. where somebody says, you know, we have this pro we have every man Jack and they have a beard cream and you're going to write it with the thing and it needs to seem like, Oh brother, where art thou? And here's some lyrics and at 26 seconds, there's going to be a voiceover that says this and blah, blah, blah. And, but he would need three seconds at the top for him to look around the room. And then he starts the song about, you know, so, you know, there's that kind of thing. And you get a little demo fee and you write them a song and make their track and they take it or don't. And mm-hmm. if, they, if you get it, then you get the fee. It, Corby sang uh, Belvita Breakfast Bites. I still hear it. Steady now energy yeah. all day long. <laughs> With my big break. Grams still of riding now. Was it 13 grams that of protein? roller coaster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, things like that. Uh, and then the other thing would be like, uh, I'm in this sync band called B End with my mm-hmm. wife Angela and Jesse Parker. Mm-hmm. We just make songs. You know, we don't really take briefs, you know, um, but. So, yeah, that's different. So the, the, in scenario one, you get an email from uh, ad exec person, I don't whatever their title is. Hey, that's what we're looking for. This and this is it's, it's it could specific be, or not specific as it. You know. It could be anything from the thing I just said, the, the silly, goofy thing I just yeah. did or a beautiful, you know, cello piano underscore for, a, you know, a, it's a, so what was that big it. one in Christmas in New Zealand last year? Oh, or? the this is my wish thing yeah. for the it was like Super four years si- we had that on Glade, you know, and it was in the Disney Christmas program and we just got royalty check on that for like print work choirs and stuff. Crazy. You know, yeah. And that was to a brief. That was so, to a brief. So that's one way. And yeah. then the other way is what the you're other talking way about now. Is, is what we do with BN where I'm working on our new EP now. We just I just got a single back for mastering. We just make music. We know it's syncable. I think Angela told me that ever this. She said it's true. I'm a believer that every song that we have put out has been synced at least once. Incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. And now we have 1.4 million monthly listeners. So this is super interesting. I was gonna like this dovetails into what I wanted to ask you about because the sync game is different than it was 10 and 15 years ago. Yeah, so that sync game is we just we just make the music. And if you like it, put it in your show. And sometimes, like we had um, Sephora last year, Christmas, or just a couple of years ago. And it was kind of like, hey, can you open it up and Christmas it up? You know, because it wasn't a Christmas song, but mm. we, they wanted to sound. So, it so I just it up put, a little I put some sleigh bells and some chimes and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, okay. I wanted to know a little bit about, though, like, like when um, Scene Game then, Scene Game now. It seems like you're not getting the twenty thousand uh, dollar placement in Grey's Anatomy anymore. The it fees forty. Gone. It's more. Well, it was insane. One Tree Hill. I think oh yeah. Was, okay. Back, back then, yeah, it was forty was grand for you know, incredible. Yeah. That would be uh, your income for a year plus. Everyone's watching. You can tour now. You got a yeah. song. It's a whole different alternative to radio. Yeah. Yay. Not that doesn't happen so much. That doesn't happen so much. Partly because, I mean, you think about it, there's just more shows. Yeah. So in a, in the decentralization kinda, of yeah. the entertainment. So it, it can be kind of nice, yeah. you know? I mean, I know what these, like Teen Moms, that's 500 bucks. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's. The Fosters, 500 bucks. Selling Sunset, 1,500 bucks. You know, Nashville, eight, eight grand. You know, This Is Us, you, you'd be getting more, you know? army wives, you know, I mean, you just go like, there's these different tiers, but the nice thing is it's not an exclusive. So you can get the same song synced over oh, four shows. That's like what's going on with Katie and stuff. Like, yeah. And, and, and the thing is like, we take small syncs because it's like, sure, we'll take it and then we'll get it synced again. in another show a month. And what's, what's interesting now, which wasn't happening 15 years ago is that you're seeing this with BN is that you get these syncs and it's driving your Spotify plays. Yes, this never, Crazy. we never even considered that Spotify will be a thing for us. We wrote a song that was in Teen Moms and uh, a DJ in Sweden saw it at two in the morning, instant messaged, messaged us on Instagram. Can I remix this? And we're like, 
Sure. So sit him stems, you know, the, the vocal, the bass, the drums, the, whatever. And they did a remix and we were on vacation. We were up north at the cabin in Wisconsin. And Angela said, how, what, this doesn't make any sense. We have 10,000 monthly listeners. You know, we just started going 20,000, 30, 40, 50, 60, you know, we have a hundred thousand monthly listeners, you know, and then, you know, our song was so-and-so just hit 4 million streams and yeah. it just snowballed and snowballed to where, you know, now it's like, okay, I can work on a song and, and think, well, if we spend, you know, 300 bucks on it and it gets a million streams, well, that's five or six grand, mm -hmm. you know, so it's kind of like, well. I can always go work on more of those. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> to your point earlier is it's, it's like, it's scratching the itch. It's, the music is really creative and super cool. And that's part of the reason why it's landing. Well, part of the reason also is that when Angela and Jesse write the songs, they know what works for sync mm -hmm. and they know what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And if there is a line that they love, that's going to hurt the sync, they take it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if there is a phrase that seems kind of normal and no brainer, that's but it. super syncable. Let's yeah. make a beautiful song around that phrase. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's, they're very, and then when I do the track, I'm very purposeful mm -hmm. on how it, you know, the tempo and the first chorus, second chorus, third chorus are all different. So you could order, you could take the first third of the first chorus, edit it with the second third of the second chorus and the third third of the third chorus. Now you have a building chorus. I mean, it's very, this is nothing about it's accidental. No, we're very little <laughs> on a silver. And we're, you know, we're very much thinking about uh, there. We, how does the track sound without the vocals? You know, mm -hmm. like, is there, is there, is there just a phrase that th that's all that matters is just the phrase mm -hmm. and, and what's around it. Is there space between that phrase where they can say some dialogue mm -hmm. and hear the phrase again? Mm -hmm. And that to me is creative. Cause like you said, everybody needs an adversary. Well, the adversary <laughs> is, is the format or great. Thanks. Uh huh. You know, uh, and did you, why, um, why did you make a band for it? Was that for fun or do you think it's, it was an important part of the success of the, of the, mm. the early efforts now is you've got a name you're writing. A, I think, a the, I think we decided that we wanted a certain kinds of songs that have a certain kind of sound to be called a certain kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Because I was doing, you know, Jesse was writing with other people. Angela's got like four of those bands. And I was doing various things, including TV and, and records and stuff. So we just thought, well, when, we, when it's us, there's going to be a certain kind of thing that happens and a certain kind of sound. We could still write and do something with the three of us, but if it doesn't sound like BN, we're not going to call it BN. It will just be a submission, you know. Mm -hmm. Under some other name or whatever. And... And so at this point with the ad execs or the people, I'm sure it's a scene, like all scenes are scenes. They all know each other. There's, you know, a handful of people making these decisions. Now bien has got name recognition. So the next and Bien song comes through, they're like, okay, oh, yes, cool. Another and great part of one. that is because the collaboration, this is what I was getting, forgot to say. So the, so all of a sudden now we're in a new part of the world, this, this European thing and a new genre, which is, mm. is this feel good dance music. Mm. So now we've done several of these remixes. Um, Same guy has done the remixes? We have, or? Two, we have two out with the same band, same remix team, and two more. What's the, they, what, so it's, it's not a guy. It's a and a m e And they're part of this label, and Anjuna okay. Beats, that I'd never heard of, that does this massive event every year at the Gorge, and, and which is a great venue. In, in Washington. Washington. Yes. Oh, yeah. And they have like, tens of thousands of people that come for the weekend and they call it group therapy and it's positive dance music. That's just about being together and loving each other. And, and it's not performed. Uh, it's DJs up there doing their thing. Okay. Jumping right. up and down with beanies on, you know, right. Uh, you know, <laughs> with, with a VN track on now or yeah. arguably. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So, then, so there's videos we could see of like 20, 30, 50,000 people sh shouting our song at the top of their lungs. Uh -huh. you know? Incredible. Yeah, we've never done a gig ever. Yeah, another version of Rockstar. So, and then we had a French DJ who did another song of ours, and he's got his all his own thing. But when I'm not trying to like, 
I'm not trying to think these DJs are going to wait till they get a load of this. I'm just like, no, I need to give them space to do something. So mm-hmm. my thing is at 85 beats per minute. I was like, I'll leave it up to them if they want to take it up to 120. You know, uh-huh. it's so it's it's kind of like we're just going to do what we do. You know, amazing. Um, that's I learned a lot in that segment. <laughs> and uh, I want to talk for a moment longer. What are we at, Kyle? How much time? Uh, we're about 50 minutes. Okay, cool. This is good. Um, so at some point along the way in your journey, you, and this probably like was a small leap from sync licensing because you're starting to work with TV people. Um, and describe you were the senior music producer on the last three seasons of Nashville, the TV show. Is executive that, music, is that right? Executive music producer. Executive music pr- producer. Yeah. Um, how did you get that gig? Well, and what was that like? Or, so yeah, good, bad. You know, I started, I, I realized, um, you know, when we did that Glade ad that you talked about, you know, the thing, I didn't really want to do it. And I was like, come on, if we get this, you can spend half the money on gear. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we got that. We got it. And we're like, whoa. And then how many then, people, do you, how many submissions do you think were in the running for that? 30 to 50. Or yeah. something like that? So that's, and then um, that same month, we got the Coke ad for the Olympics that you sang on. And I did? Well, you sang the demo. <laughs> oh, Okay. And then th- through some weird political thing, they replaced the singers. Yeah. It was you and Sophia. This is the first time hearing of it, and I am pretty upset. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's too bad for you. And somebody's friend needed to get the SAG money. Yeah. I mean, such is life. It's so. But deal. anyway, so uh, I thought, man, this is kind of fun. I got I'm I you know turn on American Idol, and there's the Glade ad, and you flip mm-hmm. over to the Olympics, and there's the Coke ad. I mean, this is this is I should keep doing this. And I started to think about. And then I started post-scoring stuff, which like I wouldn't do it with Angela. It wasn't a song. It was like scoring to picture for the, you know, like right to the second to the frame. Of, you know, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Score instrument. And I started to think I something about making music with pictures really interesting to me. I really like it. And so I was at so fast forward. I'm at Whole Foods on a Sunday afternoon. Buddy Miller. Hey, shouts across the street in that little hill center. <laughs> hey, Nashville <Tim>. stories. <laughs> and I go, hey, buddy. And because he's not a real, like a hey, Tim kind of abusive kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. He didn't and shout. He waves me over, you know. And he said, You play accordion? I said, Yeah. And he goes, You got a pump organ? I said, Yeah. He goes, Oh, thank God. He says, Come over to, uh, it was called Hasa Blues the, or uh, East Iris then. It's now. Universal and it used to be House of Blues. But anyway, come on over tonight. I'm working with T Bone on this TV show about Nashville. So I had my whole cartage brought over. Like this is my whole cartage is like a, like trunks full of Magnus chord organs and glockenspiels and toy pianos and vintage synths and a rack with stuff and you you know a B3 and Fender Rhodes and Worldster, all this stuff. All the toys. Yeah. I just brought it all because I thought Buddy and T Bone, come on. Yeah. And it was like seven o'clock. I played in that first song and I said, you know, I think he can probably use a little piano too. They're like you play piano. <laughs> like, yeah. You didn't know T-Bone. Didn't know T-Bone. But you knew Buddy. I knew Buddy. For, Not well, but uh, okay. yeah. And uh, so I played piano and they go, do you play the organ? And I said, yeah, I love playing organ. And they put up another song and I, I played some organ. And they're like, oh, you want to play organ or another song? It's like, keep them coming. And it was like two in the morning. I was just playing on song after song <laughs> after song. And the music supervisor was in the other room. It was Frankie Pine. Mm-hmm. Now a good friend of yours. And now a great friend of mine. We've done a bunch of stuff together. And one of the songs that came up was a song Angela wrote. For the so, show. For the show. Mm. She didn't even know she they had picked it. She didn't know how it got in the thing. And it was like. That's like my Angela wife. is your wife. Yeah. Angela. And, so was, and, I, and I call her and I go, we're doing some TV thing. And I just played on one of your songs. She goes, what was it? You know? And so looking for a place to shine for a shine. She goes, I don't even remember that song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's how it goes too. You know? And, um, so I started, um, working on as a musician on those sessions. And, um, I was really interested in like where they would read the script and this is how the scene goes and then the, but you can't play it. It needs to be like, you play it like you're, you know, we need you to play like you're her playing the piano or like, 
uh, you know, you have to mess up and then, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. these kind of acting stuff, like, oh, I love this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, or it's just a dream sequence, so we need real dreamy, oh, good, 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 you know, yeah. I love that. Kind of. And um, so then, like, fast forward to season four, and Buddy has taken over from T-Bone, and he's so fried, so tired. And he started handing me. So this is four years later. Yeah. yeah. He starts handing me certain songs. Like I had Connie Britton, the Raina James. The, mm -hmm. so I, I took her songs, which was, you know, that was kind of a big handover. Meaning produced those songs. Yeah. For when the she show. had a song, I would produce them. Yeah. And I had her songs and I had any guest artists. So any one off people that came in. And I think part of that was my range. You know, it mm -hmm. was like whatever that person is going to sound like if it's really sort of sweet or if it's kind of rocking or if it's kind of bluesy or if it's kind of new Orleans or Tim will be able to steer it, you know, mm -hmm. started doing that. And then I met on one of the sessions, there was a, we were doing a scene for a funeral and it was kind of like this, like precious Lord, take my hand. And it was sort of like this black girl was singing in a quasi gospel. It was supposed to just gospel it up a little bit. And I go, you mean like just a little like this? And then I went like full gospel on it as a joke. You know? mm -hmm. Russell from Lionsgate was sitting in there. And he's one of my best friends now. And he lives 45 seconds from me. He lives, moved to Nashville. And uh, so ha, 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 ha. So then we're at lunch. And he goes, hey, man, I'm working on this other show. Uh, it's all black. It's like Nashville, but it's set in Memphis. It's all black gospel. It's called Greenleaf. And uh, you want to help me? we it got some real problems in episode one and two. Can you help me to kind of solve some of these issues we're having? Uh, sure. So I ended up doing that show, season one, and I did the main title, opening song with Mavis Staples, which was amazing. I wrote mm -hmm. that. I produced that. And they had a bunch of songs in it that I did. But I got used to knowing, like, oh, this is how you deliver to post. This is how they like this. This is how you work with an actor mm. on a vocal. Mm -hmm. This is how you help sell it to the showrunner. Because it was the actor singing, in the case of Nashville at least, yeah. it was and the and actor really, singing. So, yeah. and then they're not, some of them aren't trained singers or experienced right. singers or confident singers. Or maybe so there's trained a lot in of another that. style. Like, mm. it's like we kind of kind of forget the voice lessons and just, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, or maybe like they're singing great, but maybe that's not how their character would sing. So mm -hmm. we're going to have to figure that out. So there's some acting singing too, mm -hmm. not just singing like you. And, um, so then I did Greenleaf during Nashville season four. And at the end of that season, Russell called and said, buddy is wiped <laughs> and he doesn't want to do season five. And do you want to do season five? And I said, no, 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 no. I want to do Greenleaf season two. And I want Buddy to do Nashville. And I want to go play in all the Buddy sessions. Because I was like, go, it was like taking a hot bath. It was like going to, to music school, life school, yeah. cool school. Growing. You're, you were growing. I, could, I mean, yeah. to just be in those Buddy sessions. Yeah. You know, it was amazing. And I didn't want those to end, you know. But, you know, Buddy, no, he's tired. And <laughs> if you want a show, you, sh you should do Greenleaf, you know. So I took Greenleaf. I mean, I took Nashville. Part if you, of was, he said, if you want to show, you should take Nashville. Yes. That's what I just want to make sure we get the. For, there were just other things. Yeah. There were various factors, I'll say. And um, so, and I, I loved the music on Greenleaf. I was mm. a little worried that people were going to say, what does Tim think? T-Bone Burnett, then Buddy Miller, and then... <clears throat> You, <laughs> jeez, what well, failure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, like, I thought that all the musicians that I were doing the sessions with were gonna think it was a joke, and they never mm -hmm. worked for me, or mm -hmm. they would be jealous or mad, sure. or like, I don't, I don't know. I just, I just, I thought that people would be laughing at at the prospect that I could even do that job. Mm -hmm. I don't. That's just. I'm just being honest. Sure. Right? But Angela's great, and she was just like, "This is, this is not real. This is all imagined." And I think you know that. I think you could do an awesome job. I think you're at a time in life, and you have the skill set. This is perfect for you, and you should do it. And I did it, and then very quickly, you know, I, I spent you know four or five weeks of saying no to sessions, mm -hmm. and then all the calls went away. But I realized that. 
the TV thing is the thing I love the most. Mm. I just love being a part of a bigger picture. I like being, you know, the, the music in TV is a spoke in the wheel. It's not the wheel. The wheel is the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And I don't mind working with, you know, Nashville season five, I think 26 episodes or 22. And I think we had like, say it's 22 episodes and we had 20 directors, you know, only two directors repeated. So like you're working with a lot of different personalities, you know, very tough showrunner, Ed Zwick and Marshall Herskovitz being Oscar winning movie directors, who Mm -hmm. you know, aren't, aren't going to suffer fools lightly, you know, mm-hmm. and also were awesome. And I loved, mm-hmm. I loved the, the challenge and I felt respected and supported, you know? And so, uh, and I had a team, you know, I, I had a team of, of a department you know, of people that were, we worked together and they did a great job and we, we helped each other out. And then the thing is like, you do it and you know that, I don't know, however many million people, are going to watch it on Wednesday night and then how many millions of people are going to watch it on DVR and then how many people are going to watch it 10 years later when it goes to Netflix, you know, mm-hmm. you're thinking, well, this music is getting out there. Mm-hmm. And if, and as I got older, I cared more about people hearing what I did, you know, mm-hmm. I didn't care about that before. It was like, I could make a song for my publishing deal. And once I felt private, I could throw it in the ocean, mm-hmm. you know, and I kind of got, yeah, it'd be nice if people heard it, you mm-hmm. know. So there was something great about thinking that what I'm doing right now, people may only hear once, but a heck of a lot of people are going to hear it. Mm-hmm. Um, talk, talk me through, you You said this before, but um, some of those, the nature of the production schedule on the TV show, especially like, maybe it was like because of the pandemic or maybe this is the way it is anyway, because half of those people are in LA and, and a lot of them were in, in Nashville and the showrunner and, or the director there, you know, it, was a, it would be a massive conference call and you'd talk through the script and all of the problems that would arise. And it's as fast as possible. It's just like, yes, no solution, next challenge, next problem. And you yeah. learned kind of the hard way with one of the guys. So you were like, uh-huh. do you, you know what I'm talking I about? I, I think you're talking about, uh, I think you're talking about a, 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 a. This was on a sitcom I did for Netflix called Country Comfort. Okay. Yes. We had to put, uh, this was an in-person production meeting, and he was adamant about showrunner or director, director okay. of why it had to be a certain way. And I and so I said, I understand. I'm just going to tell you things that could go wrong. Boom, 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 boom. And he goes, he goes, stop, we'll do it. And I said, also, we could this thing. And the other bit of he goes, stop talking. We're doing it your way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, don't oversell it. Like, enough said. Yeah. Like, you had me at the third reason. You, you know, is that yeah. what the story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's it. Stop, the stop talking yeah, yeah. part. But, you know, we, we did the process for a sitcom or for a drama is to have that production meeting where you get on a call and you go through the script, you skip all the dialogue. And you get to like, maybe it's a safety concern. Like then the horse gets loose. Oh, wait a second. Now we're talking about safety, Mm -hmm. you know, and then it starts snowing. Wait a second. And, you know, Mm -hmm. and then, and then uh, they eat another pancake. Now we're to props, you know, Mm -hmm. now we're in the pancake issue, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and, you know, then, you know, rain and scroll are in her closet looking at her shoe collection. Hold on a second. You know, how many how, shoes? How many shoes? Yeah. Uh, uh, how many casual versus dressy? You know, so now we're, yeah. I'm just waiting, just like not saying a word till we get to the, then they walk into the five spot and Avery's playing a song. And then it's like, now it's me <laughs> and I better have some quick answers. Yeah. You, you know? And so you talk for 20 very important seconds about two different scenes. You got 10 seconds per scene, you know? And now that's seven days of long work ahead, uh-huh. you know? <laughs> um, so you're not currently on a show. I'm not. Well, there's a strike for one. Um, are you waiting? I mean, are you interested in doing it again? Or yeah, absolutely. Kind of, that's uh, my, that's the, the thing that's fun for me about TV is uh, ultimately I like genre free. Mm-hmm. I've never been uh, big on, the trendiest sound of the moment, you know, chasing that. I think it also, that also leads to some really meteoric rises 
and huge payouts, but shorter careers. Yeah. Makes sense. Can't remember the last time I went to a Skrillex concert. Well, I mean, it's like you, maybe you're, you're, you're have a six year run as a hot songwriter and you go, yeah, but he made millions. It's mm -hmm. like, well, I want to be working. Yeah. I'd, I'd take less money because I have fun. I have a lot of fun doing it. Mm -hmm. I want to be around. I want to stay. So that's part, partly why I'm doing different things to stay vital. I don't want to feel like I'm the old irrelevant guy in a session. Yeah. That's why I'm getting in doing other things where I'm bringing new energy, new life. You know, and mm -hmm. I, I have a feeling about it like I did when I was, you know, 23 doing a session, you know, and like, I can't believe I'm here, you know. Mm -hmm. So TV for sure. Um, my TV thing has mainly been uh, about scenes that happen in TV shows that are you're to believe that Corby sang my little life at the bowling alley. Mm hmm. Or Corby got up and did karaoke. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, Corby's daughter played My Little Life at her school play. You know, like, how do we make that seem believable? Mm -hmm. how, how do we... Uh, so more than score or more than sync, it's been about stuff where people, you know, I did Big Creating Sky. Creating the illusion of reality yeah. in yeah. audio I, I, like and Big Sky might be like, you know... Um, could be a re, it could be recreating like maybe it's like we can't afford the master side of Water Shaded Pale, so we'll do a, a another version of Water Shaded Pale and pay forty grand for the publishing and pay fifteen for the recording. You, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? That mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, and I do plenty of those kinds of things for TV and film, but it might be like Carnival Row and there's an old blind fiddle player. And we don't know if it's the future or the past. And we don't know if this is Chinese fiddle or if it's Northern Norwegian fiddle. Mm -hmm. And in or, that case, you're like working with a fiddler. Well, coaching okay. Oh, it, the showrunner is just saying. And, and it can't, or it could be uh, Appalachia or it could be Ireland. Uh -huh. We don't know. Uh -huh. But it, it can't be a tune that you'd actually be humming later. It can't be that distracting, but it has to be a tune. Uh-huh. And, and it, but he can't be too good because he's old and he's blind and it's kind of scratchy, you know, but it can't be so out of tune that it's distracting. And we do have dialogue over this. So, but it also needs to be loopable. So we need at least 30 seconds, but it could go long, you know. Yeah. Like, okay, cool. And so then I, I write that piece. And I do love you, Okay. So in that, this is you uh, specific, but in that case, are you, you know, writing notes down and handing it off to a yes, fiddler and then yes. here's the, the scale and then okay, cool. writing it down. Right. Okay, note cool. for note, uh, but I call a viola player. Uh huh. They say, "Do you have a fiddle?" Yes. Do not open the case. Come over here. You do not get to rosin your bow. Uh -huh. You do not get to tune your <laughs> fiddle, and you do not get to see the sheet music. It's about this fast. There's no click. Da 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 di da di da di. It's this kind of thing. It's a triplet feel, and I'm gonna get a sound. Oh God, it's sort of nope. It's fine. Okay, now when I say go you could turn a page over and play it for me okay it's been like this Sight read it. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So cool. and then and then it's like can i please do one where i kind of tune up and rise in the bone absolutely and then i you let him do it thanks let him yeah. do it oh please use that one oh, okay cool and then i send the first one in and they love it you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's smart too i mean that's a, a testament to your bedside manner um which is that you, you didn't say no we don't need that even though you knew we don't need that because you're like acknowledging the, the musician in, on the other side of the glass, so to speak. Um, and there's letting also self-preservation because what if the showrunner says, I said real scratchy, but I think too, that's too scratchy. Do you have any, yeah. any degrees of scratchy? Uh huh. Then I go, you know what? Could you, do, do you have till tonight to see if I can? And then I just, I just pull up the playlist <laughs> and I wait four hours. So it makes it seem like I'm working on it. And I just send version one, two, three, four, <laughs> you know, because yeah, I also yeah. know that I better cover my butt. Sure. So I always have more banked. I just present the thing that's my recommend. Yeah. And then once I present it, that's my statement. And then I, you can't hurt my feelings after that. Mm -hmm. You know, thanks for listening. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to help you achieve your vision. You know, it's not my show. Um. Let's talk for just a second about you. So you've, you've been working for, uh, you know, three, four decades, maybe, maybe more, maybe less. Um, can you talk about 
how you managed to stay sane through the, all the ups and downs of the industry. Yeah, I, I have credits in five decades. That's eighties, nineties. You are old. Eighties, nineties, the thousands, the tens, and the twenties. Oh man, oh it's man. crazy, man. Yeah. So yeah, you're you're. This is you've and been I at feel, this for a I long still time. Feel young and yeah. excited. Yeah. Yeah, you're not a jaded asshole. No. Like I know. Well, some can be, but why? Why aren't you jaded? How how well, have I mean, you managed to do this? There are, uh, there are parts of me that can have been jaded mm. and can get and and I I think I have had real moments of of resentment. Mm -hmm. Like how dare you people not see how great I am and how much I have to offer. Mm -hmm. You must be idiots. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, that's terrible to admit. I'm just admitting it, you know, because I think other people could say, oh yeah, me, me too. And then again, it's like they, they get to make their choice, right? And, um, and you know, jaded asshole, I mean, I... I think I take my I can take my assholeness home, you know, like like maybe I can hold it together on the conference call with the crazy people, but I can't keep my cool with my family or something, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm not, I won't say that I'm not that. I don't think I that's my default. I think I'm getting better at it, but um I think it's it's just really difficult. I mean, it's really, first of all, we're not owed anything. Second of all, talent does not owe us success. There mm. are really talented people that I think, uh, I don't understand. Why? Why didn't they not? Why aren't they a big artist? Why didn't they get signed? Why aren't they doing sessions? There's people who play circles around me. Why do they not get, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and being loyal and nice sometimes isn't enough if you mm -hmm. can't cut it as a, on the music. Some mm -hmm. people are really de determination and I'm not going to quit does not mean that you're going to support yourself in the business because you believe in yourself and you refuse to quit. Mm -hmm. Guess what? That alone does not mean that you're not, that you're going to be able to support yourself doing this. The, that is not living life on life's terms, right? That's trying to live life on your terms, which is unrealistic because you don't set the terms. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that make sense? It does. I mean, it's difficult to know that that persistence game is a tricky one for all of us to know when to hold fast to what you think that you do best waiting for your turn, when to pivot. I'm, I'm a guy. I mean, like some of what you just said could absolutely describe me. You know, I've been at this for a really long time and I'm, you know, I, I've achieved a, a small modicum of success. I have a little house in East Nashville. I'm happily married. Um, I mostly wake up and do what I want to from day to day, which is all of this is great, but I would not say that I'm successful. Um, and I've learned to, you know, I moved here from my little f fiefdom in 07 or whatever, after having made, you know, four records. And I was like, for a second, I was like the, the kid coming up, you know, and I was, yeah. I had a manager in Seattle and there was a couple of years when every opening, every act that came through town on the big outdoor stages and even the gorge, I opened for Keith Urban at the gorge, you know, yeah, in amazing, 04. Yeah. And you and, just think it's all uphill from here. <laughs> Not uphill, but it's all everything. Yeah, this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. Just the beginning. Just the beginning. And I moved to Nashville and, you know, cut to a, a year in. I mean, two weeks into Nashville, I won Merle Fest songwriting contest. I suddenly got scooped up by a little indie label. I had all of a sudden a booking agent and a, a manager that was helping out. And then, you know, eight months later, that all of it went away, mm -hmm. not through a fault of my own, just life. And I had no employable skills, was 30 years old, and I just found myself having to get a job parking cars, which yep. is what I did for four years in town. Um, and that whole time, I was just like, I, you know, at the, up to that point, the game plan was, well, you know, give it a try. You know, you're young. You should just dream and go for it hard while you're young. You can figure it out later if it goes south. Um and I, my, my plan B was like, well, I guess I could just go back to college and, you know, disappear into academia because there's this whole other side of me that doesn't have a lot to do with music. And um, 
And that was, that then when it push came to shove, you know, it was like, okay, <laughs> you're making, you know, a thousand, $1,500 a month or whatever parking cars. You're a grown ass man. This is when you go, okay, it's time to grow up. And I was just like, man, I don't even care at all. I just, I love my life. I love, I love what I do. I love the freedom of, of trying to figure out how to do it. I, I was just like that. Those three years is when I did all the crazy stuff creatively because I wasn't trying to make a music career for that moment. And then when music kind of picked back up, I had all these new weird skills. I'd written a book, you know, they ended up getting published, which led to the show, you know, indirectly, all these things were happening that I didn't really understand. So the point of this tail is say, you know, it's like for me, the secret way forward was always try to read the room, be honest about your talents as best you can. You never really know if you're deluding yourself. I think that will maybe a lot of my life has been a little bit of delusion, but maybe that's helpful. But uh, do your best at being like, OK, in my little town, I was one of the best guitar players. OK, I, that's not the case anymore. That's not who gives a shit about Corby Lanker's guitar playing in Nashville, Tennessee. OK, well, you know, it's nice to have that skill set. But okay, what is it? What Nashville forced me to do is like, how do you stand out from an incredibly competitive, super talented community? What do you do that other people aren't doing and do that? And, you know, yeah, that's, ex I, that's I, exactly I, what I'm doing now. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And every, everybody gets to be who they are. <laughs> And, you know, some people, some people don't like some great musicians probably think like, listen to that and go, whatever, who cares how many records are played? You, you couldn't pay me enough money to play in a Blake Shelton record. Yeah. I think that's music. Yeah. You know? Sure. And, um, so, so, and they get to be that person and somebody might go, man, I just want to play jazz and I'm, and 75 bucks a night is great for me. You mm -hmm. know, I don't know how much it pays play jazz but I, you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so everybody gets to be who they are and but also i'd say it doesn't hurt to i mean to i've had a continuing education program since i was about five mm -hmm. i mean i'm sure there have already been things today that i've done or ingested as part of my you know listen to read as part of my sharpening of the saw mm -hmm. you know whether it's an instagram post on eq and a kick drum <laughs> or stopping and playing a few scales on the piano or listening to somebody talk about how they reharmonized the guitar or just, uh, I was in Pilates class thinking about, Oh, that's an interesting take on it was, they were like, like modern R and B covering old R and B, I think was this playlist, you mm. know, so I'm doing my Pilates, but I'm also listening like, well, that's interesting that that works. We didn't need that cover in my opinion, but <laughs> so, but it's, so I'm always, I'm always learning, you know? Mm. And so I think, I think you try to be as good as you, can be for sure you also try to be a good business person and have good communication or personal like have those and try and be determined mm -hmm. and also know that you have relationships set up with yourself with friends with family with your god higher power ball of love in the sky, whatever it is that says, Hey, I'm not that I, I'm learning that in the past freaking year. Mm -hmm. Right. What's I'm not that What's I'm not that? the thing. I'm not my discography. Mm. I'm not my session schedule. I'm not, I'm not what TV show I'm on, you know, that I can do that and enjoy that and be very grateful for that. But that I have this other gratitude list that's like nothing to do with that mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and i have um i have another um set and i'm t and i'm not kidding about this being very new things like it 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 ate me up so it, i didn't do it well i mean i i did it well and that i didn't like you know, kill myself you know but i certainly was not you know, living, a, 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 it wasn't human flourishing in the good life in a way that, that I would like to hope that, that everybody in the planet does. Mm -hmm. And which is sort of letting go of these things that happen as being the barometer for your value as a human. Mm -hmm. I very much have spent a lot of time. And so then what happens if now, if you, if you're not one of the top 25 guys, what if you're not that anymore? Mm -hmm. right 
Then what? Well, at least I'm getting sinks. <laughs> well, what if you're not getting sinks? Well, I'm on a TV show. I'm on a TV guy. You know, it's like this thing is like, what What if? What's, what if? I don't know. Maybe mm-hmm. I'll work at Kroger and I'll love that too. Or maybe I won't love it, but I'll be grateful for the for the job because I still want to put food on the table. And it's amazing that I, that how many years of my life I got to work a job I do like. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I think having like spiritual practices of like, a gratitude list is a spiritual practice. Uh, uh, you know, starting your day, examining your up, your motives for that day, really looking at what am I, why am I doing this? You know, am I mm-hmm. putting good things back into the world? Am I taking care of the planet? If what of the choices I'm making and like everything from the packaging of, I mean, we don't have any plastic packaging here. That's good. Mm-hmm. You know, we're talking about we're talking about human we're talking about life now outside of like just making the music and making the money that's good some at least some people are going to hear this that's good mm-hmm. and, and maybe that'll help them that's good you know i'm going to i'm hiring an engineer who's working right now on music and he's getting paid and that makes me feel good mm-hmm. and it also makes me feel good that i'm helping somebody get music done that they're really proud of and I'm going to do my best for them. And then they're also going to pay me, but I'm not overcharging them, mm-hmm. but I'm not undercharging them either. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm, and also that the gauge of success might be like, I, maybe I don't think that that music I'm helping that person make is ever going to recoup on itself or ever like sort of get passed out into the world. Mm-hmm. But maybe the, 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 the success in that was, that I got to make somebody a moment where they listen in their AirPods, laying in the bed with tears rolling down their face. I can't believe I'm so proud of this music. I mm-hmm. can't wait to send it to my grandma. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's my, I mean, that sounds so touchy feely and poetic, but it's taken me a long time to like really believe, really believe that, that even my plan of a session as like, like service, like, Maybe it's not service like building the deck service, but like really helping somebody service. Like mm-hmm. you're a terrible singer and your song is really bad. <laughs> but but you're a human being. Yeah. So I'm going to do my best to take your terrible song with your terrible singing, make it the best it can be. And at the very least, you're going to know that I saw you. Uh-huh. You came to Nashville. You brought this music in. Yeah. And you bought me Jimmy John's at lunch. And I appreciate it. <laughs> it's getting that. very specific. But, but you know what I'm saying? It's like you can look at it that way and somehow it doesn't feel like factory work. Yeah. I have a hard time thinking that you're in that situation very often. I am. Why? Because I don't think there's any, I think you take any successful, successful session player. And the, the honestly, and I've uh, talked about this with, Famous musicians who uh-huh. you know. Yeah. L.A., Nashville. And it's like, oh, dude. You know, the percentage of music that people will never hear or is just terrible. Mm-hmm. You know, my discography is only just a portion. That's just a small percentage. That's the stuff that made it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's all kinds of other stuff. Yeah. And even that stuff doesn't mean it's good just because it came out. <laughs> Um, uh, well, you you make it sound like you just, uh, had this pivotal moment in the last year. And, you know, I know that, you know, you did in a way, but you've also had a spiritual life the whole time you yes. know, concurrently. So yes. it's not as I though like you no, woke up one day I, and was like, it wasn't Oh, I got like I've been living this completely, uh, you know, fatalistic nihilistic. So would you selfish. say it's like kind of, it's, a uh, it's taken the four more than or you've it, turned more attention to that side yeah, of it. Yeah, I think you, it's like I think it's it's kind of the thing of like you kind of maybe know stuff in your gut, but you can never shake hands with it. Like mm-hmm. I know it, I know that's the truth. Mm-hmm. But I can't it's I get I don't know if it's fear or something where you go who uh maybe I would uh if I like here's a struggle that I have um, like I can, li- I listen, I'll listen to music. Uh, this happened to me in the past three days. Mm. I listen to music and I listen and I, how old was so-and-so when he played that solo? 24 years old. 
how old was David Foster when he produced that? How old was Brian Eno when he produced mm-hmm. <laughs> And I just think, I'm still I'm trying to get something yeah. going. And I feel like the guy trying to get something going. Yeah. And they were like 28. Yeah. You know? And, and I just go, oh. I'll never be that. Uh, yeah. And and there's no way there's no way possible for me just mathematically to be uh you know I, Max Martin, Hans Zimmer, uh Brian Yeah, it's too late. Brian, for, it's too late. It's yeah, just the, the output. Too late. Yeah. Um and so then I can very 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 easily just panic and and wish for a different future. Mm-hmm. I mean, a different past, mm-hmm. you know, and oh, and a different future. Yeah, and, so the, and that's get, too, too desperate. Get, get start feeling desperate, and and then I think, and I just have to go, man. <laughs> I mean, that to an earlier question. I mean, there is that. That's how ego for you manifests. Is this like comparison to the greats of all time? And you're like, oh shit, I'm not going to make it to there. That's that would be an example of you know, like you're cool cool cucumber in the in the session room and with the artist and you can work with anybody but that's where you're like oh shit the demons well but and then there's also this if, if it's just pausing like like our common life depends on our our common toil right you know what yeah. i mean so like if my toilet breaks there could be somebody coming over to fix it that is just as good at plumbing as i am at music making and I really need them and I can really appreciate them. Mm. And so it can, it's like, like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I'm not saving lives probably mm. with my music making, but it also is a great contribution to society. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like putting, putting the right sizing it. Like it's not nothing, but it also isn't everything. And we need each other. I just, I guess my, my, I'm really grateful that I've been able, if you had told my 17 or 21 year old self, 14 year old self, when I had pictures of Steve Gadd in my locker at Rib Lake High School, oh man, to play sessions, to put those headphones on, those curly cord, and but wow. And then to like literally become one of the guys that I looked at in those magazines, uh, it didn't feel like it when I was doing it, but I can intellectually understand that that happened. Mm-hmm. But my heart really, honestly, truly, it breaks my heart to think about the people who doesn't matter if it's because you're just not good enough. There are people who like, I'm sorry to say, there are people that really want to do certain things in life and they're just not good enough mm-hmm. and they never will be. Mm-hmm. And then there are people that are really, really good and somehow it just the, the timing and the cards, the things just didn't line up. Mm-hmm. They're equally heartbreaking, mm-hmm. right? And so I just feel like, man, what do you, what do you do if you're, if you're 24 and then 34 and then 44 and 54 and you're just thinking it's never going to happen. It didn't happen, which is why I'm saying if we as human beings don't have a spiritual practice for stopping and thinking about why we're here, what we're doing and what really matters. And we don't have something where we're like relating to each other. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and having a conversation with ourselves and realizing that we're not running the show and turning it over to to, to to God or what that means to you that things get can get bad mm-hmm. and you know uh, even even in, in the face of full blown success even 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 if it's just a if it was just kind of bad like he was kind of, it has been kind of bad for me this thing of like i'm never enough i never will be enough there's no you know like just working too much mm-hmm. like i can't possibly say no to anything because i feel so um validated that the phone rang that i i can become a junkie for the phone for the booking Mm-hmm. And then it's like, dude, thanks. Awesome. Loved your parts or loved your string arrangement or like, oh, please. Yes. Thank you. Fill me. Give me more. Yeah. And that lasts for a short time. Yeah. And then it's like, who's going to call me now? Yeah. You know, and so that's what I'm saying. It's just like uh, to somehow have a life that uh, you can be thankful for that, but you don't feel deserved that and you don't feel dependent 
Yes. On that. It's the old balance adage because you, what you have, um, so many people don't, which, or have what you've exercised in your life has led you to this moment is this extreme dedication and discipline and a lot of really positive qualities that we haven't mm -hmm. even talked about. Um, and it, that the caveat of that is like, you know, you work so hard. This is, you know, you were a member of a very, very, very small club that a lot of people want to be in. And that didn't come about on accident. You, some of it was luck, you know, who knows, but a ton of it was working, 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 working. And then it's, so it's very hard to step back from that and go, okay, I'm not just this thing that I worked really, really hard on. And some of it came natural. I mean, we were, you had mentioned something about like, when did you first kind of know like maybe I'm, I'm kind of good. like you think about like how does a soccer player or a football player like when do you do the thing where you go kind of got <laughs> kind of got a knack for this right? I kind of got a knack for cooking and, and I'm a pretty good public speaker or, you know I can you know my daughter's a really good competitive rock climber when does she go I kind of got a thing or my, you know I've, you know all three of my daughters have things that they're particularly good at mm -hmm. and you can see, I could see it and then when they see it and they start to to work it, you know? So part of it is like, I remember as a kid picking up, like if I went to your house and I saw that banjo, I'd stare at that banjo. I, I might be seven and you go, would you like to play it? I'd be like, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And then I would sit in this room and then I would come out an hour later and I'd play Amazing Grace in the banjo. <laughs> My yeah. parents would be like, how, how did, did you, you do it? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Or I'd get a trombone in a garage sale and then I'm playing stuff on the trombone. How did you know? How to, I, I don't know. I just kind of knew how to do it, yeah. you know? So I've never been a real practicer. It's always like I could just kind of hear stuff and stuff would just kind of like, I would just, it would just kind of like compile in my brain mm -hmm. and then I would just kind of do it, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? And, and, um, but I didn't have that same aptitude for like hanging a picture or fixing a car or, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or making dinner, you know? So, so I feel like I have, developed certain like i have i can't do there's i am so inept at almost everything in the whole world i can't i'm not qualified to teach anything i can't fix anything i can't build anything i don't make anything i have i don't i'm not even moderately skilled at mm -hmm. like everything in life <laughs> yeah that's because you didn't you didn't have a plan b except, except for a small <laughs> list and it, and I think I kind of can work in rarefied air, thin veneer, in that level. Um, uh, and then so then that kind of it's like maybe maybe I would have hand maybe I would have had a little better if I had like had a hobby. Like what if I got good at woodworking? Maybe that would have you know, mm -hmm. like when I was doing taekwondo, heavy martial arts, having something extra to do. Like I realized I wasn't thinking about how many sessions I had because mm -hmm. I was just thinking about learning my, mm -hmm. <laughs> getting my blue belt and then my purple belt. You know what I mean? So the idea, like maybe I should have had a hobby that wasn't a music hobby. Maybe I should have had a hobby that I couldn't capitalize and make money off of. We'll never know. We'll never know. <laughs> but all I'm saying is there are people hearing this that I just think, man, don't forget to be a person Yeah, and find a way to like, because I'll be honest, like my, I have been a 100% failure at my dream job, which is to produce hit records. Mm. That was the thing I wanted. Like, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a player. That's my day job. I'm waiting tables. My mm. real job is producing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've produced a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff that people have heard, but it's not, it's not records. It's, it's indie, indie stuff. And it's, those are records, but I mean, it's not major label radio stuff and it's a lot of tv mm -hmm. and i think i'm really good at it and i think mm -hmm. i'll do a whole lot more but the thing and then it's like and then being a film composer that's the other thing that you know and i haven't done that it's I've, funny i've scored uh, you know it's, you know we never things. get the one thing we really yeah. want so the, that's <laughs> probably uh, good for us the good thing is though that i was open uh -huh. i was open to like like i was talking at lipscomb and and, and i and uh, i was like tell me what you do and this guy goes I'm a session drummer. I'm like, really? You're doing sessions? He goes, well, no. I said, well, you're not a session drummer. You want to be a session drummer. 
<laughs> it's like saying I'm an Olympic. So, it's like, like and I, I'm so a really busted as balls. I was like, yeah. you can't say that, dude. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. I'm saying that I'm an Olympic pole vaulter. Mm-hmm. So you went to the Olympics? No, but I want to. Mm-hmm. But you're not a session drummer. You're a guy who plays drums. Yeah. <laughs> this girl goes, I'm an artist. I'm like, so you got a record out? You're touring? You have no. Well, you're not an artist. You're a singer. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Let's get this straight here. That's- and then, so now that I've just busted your balls and you're 20 years old, I'm trying to desperately tell you, have structures in place. You just told me what you are and you're not that. What if you keep telling that story and you start to realize it, that you're not that? Mm -hmm. Are you going to be okay with being on this planet? Please work on that now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because if there's 12 people in this room and they want to be artists, I'm always shocked if one of you makes a living as an artist. If Mm -hmm. one of you, I'll be shocked. So there's 12 of you in this room that have a lot of interpersonal work to do, mm-hmm. to dealing with <laughs> yeah, you the know disappointment what? of the thing that you want most in this life is if you, never going to happen. If you, t- I okay, to push, push back, push back on that for just a second. If if you were to tell me at twenty years old, and I was one of these twelve people in this room, that you better start working on yourself now because there's very little chance that you're going to be a successful artist. I would have, I would have politely listened to you and I would have dismissed it out of hand the second because I would have been, I, lo- I would have looked around the room and I'd been like. It's me. Yeah. And I think that's probably what you did yourself. And yes. I didn't, I didn't have any time mm-hmm. to sit there and go like, cause they, to me, that's a plan B. Oh, well I better work on my spiritual life so that when I fail that I land with, no, on that's my feet. A very good point. Like yeah. there is no spirit there. If I fail, I'm dead. And that was my, my plan. Maybe, B. maybe there's no right answer to that. Maybe it's just, what's your answer to them? What does that tell you about yourself? Mm. You know, because mm. You're right. Maybe some kid hears it and goes, oh, no. Like there was one kid, Sophia told me he was at college and knew this kid had left the class and ran, not walked, ran to the admissions office and dropped out. (laughs) And he said, it was the best moment of my life. Mm. I want to thank your dad. Oh, wow. He realized this ain't it. After that that, that one? Running. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Mid semester. Well, great. I mean, you and, know, you know, but somebody else is going to go. That guy's a jerk. You know, it's about you. Yeah, fuck yeah. You man, you don't tell me that. It's like, okay, now what are you going to do with yeah, that? Yeah, what are you going to do about? What are you going to do about? Yeah, that? you know what? So, but still, I'm also saying, and mark my words, or or some kid might say, I'm still going to be determined, and I hear that. I need to make sure that I don't leave a wake of ruined relationships. In my, like I'd stab my mother in the heart for a record deal. Yeah. I mean, we both know tons of people in the scene who are really nice. Their, you know, their radar for what you can do for me is constantly going. And if you pass the little whatever in their head and they're like, oh, you can do something for me. I'll be really nice to you. And, um, that kind of, uh, kindness, politeness, whatever is something that's so unpalatable to me. I just have always like instinctively ran, ran from it. And I know so many of those people and I encounter them, you know, often enough in polite company that whatever you can be, get along with anybody. But I hope I'm going to say something and then I'm going to say something against it. I hope that I have lived my life in such a way that I was good to people that couldn't do anything for me. Yep. It, be it a person at the grocery store or whatever. And mm-hmm. I'm sure that I've fallen short. And there's this other part of me that's I'm like, yeah, maybe you should have been more of an asshole. Maybe you'd have gotten a little farther if you'd have just been a little more aggressive. Um, but on balance, but you can be a hard worker and not be a jerk. Well, I mean, I hope so. And I think maybe I, maybe I occupy that territory, but, um, there, it's just that, yeah. What I wanted to say was hopefully we all live on planet earth minus a few of us. And of in so doing you, you learn a thing or two along the way. And hopefully you learn to take, to at least acknowledge the people in your life that you encounter on a daily basis at the very minimum is that's a, that's a lot. Even there's even in this day and age of phones and face, you know, it's always what you can do for me. I can't even imagine dating now because of, it's just such a um, marketplace of ego. fulfillment. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I think you're right. Let's cultivate our uh, spiritual 
natures because the, at the and end I of the day, you, we you really are those people. You said, I'm going to say something, I'm going to say something against. But I'd also say, maybe you're going to say, I'm saying, I'm going to say something. Okay. And then I'm going to say something else. And they seem opposite and they can also live together. Mm. Right? Hyperconfident failure. Yeah. Right. Or like, so grateful to be here. Um, this music is going to be really popular and I think it's terrible. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, um, um, really, really grateful for my workspace. Kind of wish it was a little more hyped out. You know, um, <laughs> love the variety of work I get. Resentful that I never was labeled as the guy who's best at the so and so. So glad to live in Nashville where the, there's not terrible traffic in. Man, I should have gone to US, uh, UCLA film school. Yeah, you mm-hmm. can you can have both, mm-hmm. right? At the they at the same time, and you go, isn't this fascinating? Mm-hmm. There are two things that are sort of opposite that are that are so totally true. I mean, this is all of life. Where opposite, there are things that are completely true that are opposites. I mean, think about that. It's just how it works. And people that don't accept that, I think, are missing out on something. And also are being being deluded and are living a, a less rich life, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, I don't in, I don't envy David Foster, who is three quarters of his way through an egot. Um, well, I, did you watch the movie? I did. That's what I'm, I, I watched him, and I was just like. That's not me, and I'm okay. For those of you who don't know, David Foster, an incredible producer, songwriter. He wrote uh, lots of this. Sh- I think of him as like those great Chicago songs I listened to growing up. Incredible. Uh, incredible. Incredible and discography. Amazing player, producer. Incredible arranger. career. All of the things. Yes, um, the, he, he And this, there's a documentary that came out on his life, which is worth watching. And... Um, what you get, you know, is at the end of it is he really, really, really wants the Tony. He's gotten a Grammy. He's gotten an Oscar. He's gotten an Emmy. It's Emmy, Grammy, Oscar. No, doesn't have the Tony. And uh, it's, he. The, it ends on him just being like deeply, deep, I would say deeply unhappy for not having gotten, he's 70 years old. And then I, and I, and I, that was really impactful for me when I saw that. And the thing that just kept happening in my brain was if he got a Tony, he would just want another. Mm-hmm. That, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. because sure. he, he, he wouldn't be. And I, when I say he, I mean us, we, that's what I mean. Yeah. If you set up a life just like human that, nature. then you just want another. Yeah. You know, so uh, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, yeah. We, we picked, we, you, you've picked a very difficult, um, because it's not just a job. This no, I was going to say it's in, it, it, this, this enterprise is very it's dangerous. You know, a job it's bad a, for your a, health. You know, a career, a job is like you 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 go to a company and you go and you work from nine to five five days a week and you have a four hundred one k and you get a three percent raise every year and and you get vacation paid vacation days and a dental and a, and a health plan for your kids and there's your retirement and there's something like that's awesome about and sort of appealing about that. Sure. And also, uh, also frightening for me, like uh, the same place every day, five days. No, no. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but this, this thing invades every space in your our life. weekends yeah. and our evenings and our marriages and our, our, uh, you, you know, we, you, you don't, you don't, you don't quit. It doesn't stop because you quit working on it. I mean, it's always this, it's always a thing. It's, you know, follows you around like this cat, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, I just, I think that being able to just say that it, it's true and that it's happening out loud to other people. Like I remember I was sitting in a room and we were, we were doing a, was Lionel Richie Shania Twain duet and it was we were booked for like three sessions for one song a double scale you know and and, and they had all kinds of sushi and Lionel and all those handlers and everything in there you know and there was this incredible band of musicians and I said something and um, 
just these are like world class musicians and drummer said something like man I just don't know how I ended up here and he was older than me you know and, and I was like what and he goes I don't know how I got I don't know what, I, what business I have being here <laughs> it's like really and he goes I think about that I, that's what I think most sessions I'm on and they're like me too <laughs> and then somebody else came in and they're like hey man and like, oh, heck yeah, for sure. And somebody else comes in. And, what about you? And these, you know, characters, feel, characters is like, yeah. oh, yeah. You know, and it was like, you mean five of the world's best musicians just walked into the room and everybody felt like they were an imposter, you know? Mm. And uh, that was like, wow. You yeah. Know, uh, may, maybe, do you think that's part of it that keeps you there? Maybe if you start thinking that you should be there. You lose your edge. I think, I mean, there's gotta be something to that because it, you, what is it? Um, being, being great. You're never great. It's just a process of being great. You're never, you never get there. Uh, it's like all of the important, difficult, hard to acquire skills in life are earned through constant practice. I think that that life. And so if you're all of a sudden you're like, I don't need to practice anymore. To me, that's, that's where my mind goes to with the resting on the laurels part. And so I think it's that, um, restlessness, that insecurity that, you know, keeps you, ah, I got to lose it. I guess it could also be uh, humility in a good, in a good way, mm -hmm. you know, but, and I, and I not, uh, I just, not when people say not to sound like what they mean is they're, I know I'm going to sound like, mm -hmm. so I'll say, I know I'm going to sound like the old guy. I sound like the old guy. And I guess I am the old guy, but, I see a difference in, and I don't mind who's, I don't care who hears this. I hear a different, I see a major difference in the, which is also why I'm happy to not do three sessions a day anymore of, with younger players, you know? Um, mm. It's like, there seems to be like, we know what's best. Of course I should be here. Don't you know who I am? Mm. You just sit over, put your pretty little head over there, watch us work our magic. It mm -hmm. was very different when I was coming up. It oh, was just, I was going to ask you if I thought, if yeah. is that the nature of being young or that's what you're saying? This is a generational generational. Thing. The new kids. Very different. When I was coming everything. up, it was like you def, uh, deference De to the leader, mm -hmm. to the producer, the producers knew music. They knew what was going on, you know, and, mm -hmm. And there was a thing of, of there was a kind of a hierarchy, even of like before before cell phones, like we'd always be checking our messages because you're always constantly checking your messages and you got your little book and you're writing your thing, you know, <laughs> like on the phone, like the landline. Yeah, like the, the studio, your, the studio, the studio the lounge, line. everybody just incessantly checking your messages. Hey, man, can you do this? And you'd write, <laughs> you didn't call back. Yeah, I can do it. You know? And um, but he would, he, he would there was even a hierarchy of like. If so and so was older and had done more sessions, then they got the phone first. There was a mm. real, and I see a lot of like sharp elbows out now. You know, there was never anything of like, you wouldn't go around the producer to the artist. Mm. You wouldn't ever try to get the producer to cast a different band. You just let it lay. Mm. There seems to be a very different thing of like almost Wild West kind of. I don't know if that's good or bad. Hmm. Uh, I don't prefer it. And I don't think it has the same kind of honor and beauty. Hmm. And I was going to say, it doesn't seem as honorable. It doesn't have a sort of, sort of tribal tradition agreement mm -hmm. um, that it did. Uh, so what if, for whatever that's worth, but we can all, we can create our own communities. I believe, you know, we can, we can choose to work with people who, have the sort of ethics and morality and appreciation. Like I, I don't have, I'll work with somebody. You can call me, you can forget my name. You can call me shithead and you can call me at three in the morning and you can never thank me. And you can scream at me. Th that's okay with me. Mm. It just costs a lot of money. <laughs> right. Yeah. Smart. Yeah, sure. So it doesn't hurt my feelings. Yeah. I'll never complain about it. It doesn't make me mad. I get to, I get to choose that that's for, some people will say I will not be disrespected. Okay, fine. I'll be disrespected. Here's what it costs. To it be costs four times what it did last sure. time. Sure, yeah, and and some and uh, you know eight what? times some people will take that deal. And I go yeah. great. Yeah, fine. Let's go. Whatever. Twenty four hour, twenty four seven. Call me. Here's sure. what it costs. 
So, um, so I think that's, that is a really helpful piece of advice mm-hmm. and not just practical advice for a career in the music business as a, in the service industry of the music business, but also just life advice to like, the less you can take things personally, um, and, and just realize that on some level, everything in your life has a price minus your personal relationships, you know, in your professional life. And just to think about it that way and be like, okay, what am I, I'm willing to do almost anything for almost, you know, given the price I'll think I can, you know, imagine a number. And that's a great example of like here. Okay. I'm a very talented guy and I'm willing to take endless abuse from you for this much money. And you know, you don't tell them that, but that's the calculation in your mind. And that becomes entertaining. Yeah. yeah. I just think, I still feel like I won. Yeah, you know? totally. I but, mean, who cares? But then, okay, so then I'll say the opposite that can also live. That I think I've always been mindful of when something, this is in the work arena, if I started to, if it diminished my love for music, for myself, or people and humankind, I got very scared. Mm. I could feel it, you know, like, for some reason there would be like really like, terrible sessions that I would just think, why do, why is this so fun? You know? And then there were some that I would just think, I got an attitude rising up that is not the kind of, I'm not being the person I want to be. Mm. And it's not fair to them for me to show up with this attitude already. So next time they call me, I'm going to say, thank you so much for calling. It means a lot. I wish I could do this one. I'm not able to do this, this one, this one. Can't do this Wednesday. It's mm-hmm. the truth. I, 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 I can't do it. And then maybe they call me again. I don't, I'm not any, I don't say because you are this yeah. or because I've decided. I, know re, I don't need to say that. Sure. Because maybe in a week I'll be like, thank you, God. I literally prayed this morning that I could get $150 to go to the grocery store. And this is my $150. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And I go, <laughs> but maybe if I don't need the 150 bucks, I don't want to go play in your crappy song. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I think, uh, you know, I've, I've told, I've always had this, I've had a string of young guys, helpers at my place, engineers. And I, I have no, I have no bad blood with any of them. And I talk to all of them and, and, and it's gotten to where they hire me now, which I love, you know, I love working for them and taking direction from them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've, and I hire them for like way more than I ever paid them when they worked for me all the time, you know, it's fun. And we get together socially. And so anyway, I've told those guys, if, if there's anything you can do, and there's a lot you can do in your human powers to not have bad blood, anybody in the planet and I had one person for a long time but I can honestly say there's not one person anymore there's Mm -hmm. nobody that I could run into at Sam and Zoe's that I would go awkward Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know so if you can you can back out of relationships without losing your cool and Mm -hmm. losing friendships you can do that you can you can without even ghosting them you Mm -hmm. can you can (laughs) you know you can a small town and it's a small world like just mm-hmm. keep things good with people mm-hmm. why why not you don't have to work with them but you don't you don't have to fight with them either well and insofar as you have um control of whatever project because some of you know outside of this session guys you're always it's usually somebody else's project that you're serving them um i i've that's never been my gig but i've kind of as i've made my way in the world it's been usually me like putting the band together or putting the crew together or casting the movie. And I mean, in my wife is the same way. It's just f- foremost in our mind. It's, it's like above talent. It's like, do I want to go through this journey with this person? And because that's at the, at the end of the day, that might be all we have from this is this memory of a yeah. very intense time. And is this a memory I want to make with these people? And if it is, you know, whatever, then you do this calculator, you know, sometimes that person's not right for the role or whatever. But, um, I think that we've been really lucky in that. And I've been lucky even in the music side of it is that I've maintained, I'm having bad a thousand on bad blood and relationships, but you know, really high. And in the ones that I don't have now, I've endeavored to make good, you know, and like, um, 
I don't, ha- yeah, I don't have the, I don't have the icky in my heart. Yeah. And to not have icky in your heart is, uh, it does, it keeps you like young yeah. and happy and you don't go to yeah. bed. You don't have to drink, you don't have to, you know, it's, um, it's such a win in the world. And, yeah. and I liked it. I think your testament to the, the fact that, you know, it's not a zero sum game. You don't have to be an asshole to get ahead. You don't have to screw people. In fact, you can be great to everybody and still have an amazing career. Um, did you ever see Supermensch? Uh, oh God, you got to watch that movie about, um, the great manager. Um, it's such a, it's, you'll just get such a kick out of it, but he was, um, he, I'm forgetting his name right now. Um, but he, he managed, he managed, he had like three kind of phases of his career. He managed Alice Cooper in the very, that for his whole, he's still the Alice Cooper's manager. Shep Gordon is his name. And he's got this, (laughs) this great infectious, like full hearted laugh. He's he's had a crazy life, um, drugs, whatever. But the whole time, he's good to everybody, mm-hmm. and everybody loves him, and he loves everybody, and that's um, a nice thing to remember. I've rem- it's a nice thing for me to remember when I'm like worried about being too nice. I hate it when people call me nice, and I am kind of nice. But um, you can be nice. Well, you can ni- be like ni- Shep. Nice you can be can like be Tim. Sort of a so- can be a southern sort of uh, agenda driven. Yeah, you know, it just, like, if it if, means if, benign, I don't like but, that. But kind is different. You know, nice me, nice can be, I know you're putting on something because you don't want me to think ill of you, mm. which is very ego driven, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, to I was going to say to the thing, like uh, back to we all, everybody gets to be who they are. Now, so we make choices on um, this interpersonal. And then we also make choices like there are for sure things that I could have done to be richer. And, uh, you know, sometimes I wish I had more money, but then I think, what I do I wish I'd have done those things to make me richer? And most of the time, it's no, I don't. Mm-hmm. So I think it's also like, it, it, to me, that's like just mind, like being aware, like I could do this and I would make more money doing this, but I wouldn't be happier. Which do I want more right now? Mm-hmm. temporarily un- being unhappy and having more money or I need happiness. I'm not going to do it. You know, and then there's no wrong answer, of course, you know, like, cause everything's sort of temporary, but there are a lot of things where I thought, man, like p- particularly like the variety of genre, you know, like here's an example, you know, I did a lot in Christian music, did a lot in Americana music and, and television, country music. I played on a lot of rock bands that didn't have keyboard players. A lot of those. But I never really felt like I was all the way in. I, like I, kind of, I still kind of like feel like I know everybody, you know. But I'm not all the way in to the scene. Mm-hmm. But that's just that's a fact, not necessarily a problem. So I know it's like maybe that feels kind of lonely, you mm-hmm. know, or like doing TV work or scoring that could be really lonely. So it's you just kind of say, well, maybe maybe I'm going to do string arrangement. String arranging is really lonely. Maybe I don't need to do that more than seven days a month. You know, things get dodgy after that. Mm-hmm. You know, seven 16-hour days of string arranging is all I want to do. And, you know, not 26. Yeah, and, and maybe that's, know, you know, to just bring it back to the spiritual side of it, and may, maybe that's the point of all the spiritual practice is it, keeps you in this somewhere in this this zone of sanity where you kind of keep your tools sharp of awareness about your heart and your spirit. And you, you know, you're, you, um, to use your analogy of not being all the way in, I think in, I think there's people that are all the way in, in in their, uh, specific, I'm an electric guitar player in this band. And they're also, they have a spiritual life. I'm not saying those things are mutually exclusive, but like the, the spiritual life keeps you at once removed from the, the immediate experiences of your life among other things. But that's one of the things it does. Like what you were saying earlier, 
Um, did I get this amazing gig? Oh, you loved this. Okay, good. I got good. I'm a good person. I did this good. And then a few days later, oh, the phone hasn't rung in a minute. Oh, I'm a bad person. I know this one so well. I think we all do. And it's, that's when your spiritual life or, you know, like you're in the session and all of a sudden you're like 26 days in your string arrangement because you keep saying yes. And you're like, wow, I hate my life and I want to die. Yeah. And it's because you didn't listen to yeah. this thing and, in your heart. And I think it's hard to do alone. Mm-hmm. I think it's, I think it's impossible to do alone. Mm-hmm. I think if you don't have maybe a group of maybe a handful of people that you could talk to either planned or unplanned and then, you know, maybe, maybe a friend, a spouse, and then a, maybe a, a group like you could create a group of like independent singer songwriters that live in East Nashville and we meet every other Tuesday and we're just going to get real. Mm-hmm. Everything stays in this living room, you know? Or, or something to just somebody you could call on the way home from a session and go, I played in a really high profile artist today, but I have this nagging thought that it's really lame music. How do I frame this? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or like, can you, could you help me? Here's what happens when I do too much of this. What do you think is in a reasonable amount of days a month for me to do? You know, what's a reasonable amount of music row sessions that you think I should accept in a given month for my personal sanity? You know, I think I, I think that's really, really good. Mm-hmm. And and so having that circle I and mean, the circle may change because mm-hmm. maybe those people don't have the perspective you want. Maybe you don't feel like it's, you're getting good advice. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe they don't understand. But if if you try to. If you try to do it on your own genius idea, self will, it's just not, that's not right. That's not okay. Yeah. You, you don't have, we don't have the answers to our own questions, I believe. Um, I think that's a pretty good place to end it. This has been super fascinating to me. And I think really helpful to a lot of people that might be listening to this, be they, uh, you know, new to Nashville or coming to Nashville or long time here, listening to a guy that's uh, done it all different kinds of ways and live to tell about it. And since you brought your accordion, I think if it's cool, we might play yeah. one. Yeah. And um, let's not rehearse it. Yeah, we won't. Oh, good. I, I wasn't planning on it good. to give you a taste of your own medicine. <laughs> um, let's get that set up, Kyle. You just come in whenever. Okay. Okay. Someone give me a speaking spell Cause I can't talk for all my cry Looked up and the sky just fell Feel like I was struck by lightning I can't sleep, I can't breathe I never thought it would be this bad It just hurts Yes It just hurts me It just hurts me so It just hurts me so oh, 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 oh. I never thought it would end like this Our first kiss was a supernova In trance like a hypnotist Said you lay it in my palm like a four-leaf clover My luck has run out There is an uh-oh Dad I look around, one thing that I'm all alone I got nobody to call my own It just hurts, oh, it just hurts me yeah. It just hurts me so It just hurts me so oh, 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 oh. Yeah. All this love is making me crazy I always thought that you got my back But you were laughing at me like a Halloween baby You are a holy roller, I am a roller coaster You are the telephone pole, I am the show poster Big legs from that show pen 
Hey, thanks for watching. Click the like and subscribe button if you wouldn't mind. You can click over here to watch another complete episode or click here to watch a playlist of the songs of the Morse Code podcast. You know you want to, you know you want to, you know you want to.